Well, welcome to the Brexit story, the fallout and opportunities. Um, first of all, let me welcome the panel members. We have Marcus. Marcus, from, uh, would you like to introduce yourself, Marcus? Roger, hello, and thanks for being invited. Yes, my name is Marcus of Trade with Europe. We're a UK company based in Bristol, helping UK businesses to trade with Europe. Thanks, Marcus. Stefano, welcome and thank you for joining us. Perhaps you could just introduce yourself as well. Oh, thanks for inviting us. Um, my name is Stefano Cucello and I work as an international trade advisor uh, in the, for the Department of International Trade in the Southwest region. Thank you very much. Well, welcome, gentlemen. Um, very topical discussion on uh, Brexit uh, and the, the fallout that we've seen from the very short period that now, what, 20 days we've been working on Brexit uh, or suffering the opportunities of Brexit. Um, I guess the first thing we might just have a summary of, of the depth of the agreement and where we see the, the risk opportunities or the risks within that to, uh, to international trade from here to Europe. Um, Marcus, could you just give us a bit of an overview in your view of the... Yes, of course. Um, so I've established a, a small list of um, provisions that affect uh, cross-border trade for specifically for UK SMEs and obviously for uh, EU SMEs also because trade deals are also reciprocal, uh, always reciprocal. So uh, what we expect in the UK or, or what, what we have, the, the, the hurdles we have to overcome in the UK, the same applies for our uh, partners in the EU. So, um, first of all, a general compliance issue which uh, involves GDPR. In order to stay compliant, if you offer goods or services in the EU or you monitor the behavior of people in the EU, you need a um, EU data representative and vice versa, people in the EU need one in the UK. Um, and this is a different job to your data protection officer, so just to let you know. Um, then customs clearances will obviously change. Um, you now have to complete customs declarations for every consignment destined for the EU or Northern Ireland. And uh, you can do this yourself, uh, but people haven't done this before, we would recommend that they seek uh, forwarders or agents to do this for them. Um, the, the good news is that the uh, each other's programs for trusted traders will remain. So the, for the UK, that will be the authorized ec economic operator, the AEO status. Um, then EORI numbers. If you export to the EU, you will need a new UK EORI number um, issued by the HMRC. And you will also need an EORI number of the EU country that you import to, or the countries, which you need to apply at, at their uh, customs authorities. Just, just to cut across you, Marcus, I think that's a yeah. very important point you make there, um, that we're now dealing, what, with 20, 23 different countries, effectively? 27. 27. Yeah. Or actually more, because it's not only the EU, it's the EEA which is EU plus uh, Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway. Uh, so it's 30, yeah. 30, yeah, 30. So, so basically you, you need that, the EORI number for each of those territories. Yes, that's right. The each, each one you want to import to, if you just import to one country, say the Netherlands, use the Netherlands as a bridge to, to for inner EU distribution, then you only need the one for the Netherlands, because the Netherlands is where the distribution send hub is. Right. Um, so, next one, tariffs. There are no tariffs uh, unless your goods originate to a certain percentage from a country outside of the EU or the UK, and by originate, uh, I mean the ingredients or components or 
the uh, the level of processing so if a good comes from the far east and it's further processed in the uk then it'll gain more uk origination yeah so but this is a difficult task you need to look into if your goods do not comply as uh, being from the uk then um, you need to pay extra tariffs on the import uh, this is by the way this is to to prevent circumvention of goods coming in from other uh, trade areas yeah so which is which is this is a normal thing then uh, vet payments there are quite a few changes on vet rules uh, for um, in-depth uh, uh, information you can uh, check the um, the uh, I think there's an Institute of, of UK tax advisors um, I'm just in the process of finishing a blog about this so I will share this with you um, and I will share it on the trade with international <coughs> trade with Europe uh, site also so you can yeah, get all the links also so that are a few changes. Good news here, UK businesses can postpone their VAT declarations until they have recovered their VAT payments. So it is a great help in terms of cash flow. In other words, if you import, uh, you don't have to do your VAT declaration straight away, but you can wait um, until, um, if your business is not registered, until you can um, uh, um, claim this back basically so um, and if your business is not vet registered now is the time to think possibly about a vet registration to uh, recover your vet right there's three more points uh, food safety from now on there will be SPS checks that's sanitary and phytosanitary standards checks for any live animal products or products of animal origin or some plant products or agri-food products that's for food businesses product safety the UK had the product marking CE basically the whole of Europe had it um, this is now replaced by the UK CA product marking which means that companies who sold goods um, that require the CE marking, such as toys, for instance, or medical devices, will now need to be in the EU in order to obtain that marking because it's only for EU companies. So they need a legal presence in the EU. And the last point is oh, no, sorry, it's not the last point. It's a labeling requirement. So any again food business operators need to fulfill labeling requirements which is an EU address or Northern Ireland address on their product labels and um, they either need to be in the EU themselves by an EU presence or they can choose an importer wholesaler whatever who does this for them but they need to consider if they choose an importer or wholesaler or whatever they are dependent on these people they will give away control because they have to share sensitive business information so this is a decision to make so this is as far as goods trade is concerned now two points regarding financial services and that's a big thing because 80 percent of uk exports are services and uh, this hard this sector has hardly been touched in the in the deal so th there are no provisions for it basically um, financial services UK businesses cannot offer financial services in the EU anymore they need to be in the EU um, and I've just read this morning 170 business worth 170 billion has just moved to Paris and two and a half thousand jobs in financial trade uh, and also qualifications, some uh, qualif professional qualifications aren't recognized by the EU anymore. So we have to see what this, these effects are on HR decisions and so on. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, these are the main changes in short for cross-border trade. Hmm. Well, thank you, Marcus. I mean, that gives us a very interesting checklist of information. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
we've obviously seen and heard in the press quite a lot of um, frustration on the on the transfer of goods out of the UK, and we've seen examples of those goods being delayed. Um, Stefano, what, what's your experience on the way um, SMEs have picked up the the necessary understanding of the rule change, particularly having listened to what Marcus has said? Well, first of all, thanks a lot, Marcus, for the almost an exhaustive list of uh, challenges that uh, companies uh, uh, need to go through uh, after kind of the deal has been uh, kind of struck at the end of uh, last year. Uh, in answer to your question, Roger, is uh, my uh, kind of experience um, with uh, small medium enterprises uh, in the Southwest is that uh, it depends. It depends in terms of like there are companies that have been uh, quite um, kind of active in uh, uh, getting the information through all the different resources that uh, are available and some others that uh, really so that uh, by actually having a deal they didn't have to do anything so there is a bit of a mix back there so again uh, the, the, the thing that didn't help is that uh, you know the deal was uh, towards the end of the year and uh, the implementation was straight away in uh, January. So a lot of companies were kind of um, uh, trying to actually be as uh, ready as possible, uh, but at the same time the information was just released at the last minute. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of, uh, as I said, uh, in terms of uh, uh, information, um, I think that the, the information is there and uh, some companies, uh, as I said, they were kind of uh, um, not ready, not because, uh, um, because of the information that were not available, it's just because they thought that the deal was going to actually get all these things away. And, uh, and unfortunately, it's not the case. Even, uh, you know, one of the points that uh, Marcus uh, uh, illustrated, that uh, there are not tariffs on the goods uh, between the EU and the UK and vice versa, well, that is uh, not the entire story. Uh, the reason for that, you need to actually really understand uh, your tariff code in terms of the goods that you are uh, exporting or importing and find out whether the rules of origin linked to that uh, uh, commodity code are kind of uh, got a preferential uh, treatment in terms of tariff. Uh, now, again, that is a quite complex uh, 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 kind of subject that, uh, you know, you, you need to actually get uh, kind of uh, professional advice. And, um, you know, it's not so straightforward because, again, it's also like uh, the bilateral accumulation that it gets into the kind of uh, uh, pot as such uh, that complicates even more things. So, uh, you know, the information is there, uh, but at the same time, um, my job is to actually make sure that the companies are aware of those kind of uh, um, challenges, uh, especially the small companies. Um, and, um, you know, and people like Marcus, for example, it would be a great help for these companies moving forward. Mm. But coming back to your comment on rules of origin and, and the tariff codes, um, from my experience, just talking to a few SMEs, there seems a lot of confusion on this. In what respect? Well, understanding how, how to bring about the, the, the detail of the source of origin uh, and relate it to the tariff code. Is that, is that, is that definitely well, clear? Again, the, the, the thing is that the, the company need to be kind of uh, aware what commodity codes uh, is related to their goods. Now, there, is, there are different tools uh, that uh, the Gov UK uh, has got, and one of them is to actually kind of uh, state exactly what the goods are and give you the commodity code. Once you've got the commodity code, there is another tool that actually allows you to actually check, uh, not just within Europe, but any countries that you want to export to, uh, what is required in terms of rules of origin, in terms of documentation, custom declaration, uh, a kind of uh, certification, labeling. So it's, um, you know, I, I, I could actually uh, share uh, afterwards that uh, uh, kind of link that I think is a really good uh, uh, kind of starting point for those companies that are struggling. 
and um, so that, as I said, it gives a, it gives a, a, an overall uh, kind of a view of what is required to export to a certain country once that you know what the commodity code is for your goods. Okay. Marcus, any, any comments on that at all? No, I think what Stefano there said is, is well comprehensive and um, it, it portrays how complex and difficult the whole thing is. Mm -hmm. So um, it is a challenge, for, especially for SMEs who have other problems than, than looking at how to get their, cross, their stuff across a border. I mean, they're, they're, their main job is to sell their goods and, and, uh, and only to achieve the status quo they had last year, they have to do a lot more in terms of time, effort and money. Mm -hmm. Just coming back to your G GDPR, that's going to be quite a, a challenge also for SMEs, isn't it? Yes. Um, so a lot of this, including the GDPR uh, regulations, the new ones. So if you need a EU data representative, um, you would look at paying a few hundred pounds extra a month just to maintain a, a, a customer database in the EU of, of EU individuals. Yeah. So uh, this is just one example for, um, for the cost that UK SMEs have to expect. And as I said in our panel yesterday, many SMEs now have to assess the situation and make a decision as to whether carry on their EU uh, trade or export in general or just concentrate on the, on, on the interior market, on the UK market. And um, also, as we discussed yesterday, that has huge implications on the resilience of a company. Yeah? Um, so uh, I can only recommend to look at it closely and seek solutions to export because it's export is simply uh, yeah yeah it's important I, th I think you're right we, we, looking inward is not going to solve the situation um, in terms of GDPR have you got any information on, on through the IT that can assist in that in some detail well um, there is if you check the um, ICO website so that the, the British uh, authority for uh, for um, controlling anything that has to do with data protection it will give you again there's there's on our website tradewitheurope.com there is a blog on it with a link to the ICO website and it says exactly what you require but in short if you offer services or goods in the EU or you monitor the behavior of individuals say consumption uh, behavior consumer behavior you do need one if you don't have a branch office in the EU so if you are in the EU you're fine if you're only UK business you do need one we offer it from 199 euros a month and that's cheap uh, compared to to other providers mm -hmm. and you got to be careful you get um, software and you get uh, cheap offers but this software is nothing else but a platform where people data subjects so people who are affected by a possible breach can either place requests or complaints and that's it but there's no service behind it so we have a mitigation service and so on and so on with it yeah so basically it's a kind of um, book this and you are well it's not kept carefree because there can still be complaints but we try and uh, mitigate everything for out-of-court settlements if something happens okay that's good news uh, and coming moving on to sort of customs doc documentation again you read in the press that there's a lot of problems with the documentation going across the channel and to some extent coming this way i mean we, we've had the covid situation where um travel and so forth is very much restricted. So are we only seeing the tip of the iceberg at the moment? Are we going to see this growing as a major problem? I, th I think it's, um, uh, if I may, it's, um, it's something that uh, companies uh, they were concerned about the effects of Brexit and therefore they actually stockpiled 
and therefore you're not seeing uh, the real picture now in terms of uh, you know ports uh, uh, October uh, um, and so in that respect uh, short in the short answer I think it, you're going to see more kind of uh, uh, challenges uh, in the near uh, future but at the same time uh, again like we said yesterday is uh, you know companies are, are actually getting ready now and therefore you know possibly in a couple of months time they know what they need to do and uh, and therefore the you know the the, the, the the kind of situation will actually improve uh, but at the moment I, I think that uh, you know the, the situation is that the polls are still a kind of a normal kind of a situation. We didn't see any kind of cues that we were expecting, but the reason for that is because of stockpiling before uh, you know Christmas. And um, you know so that's my that's my view anyway. Mm. Yes, it's, um, it's it's really causing some problems. But in terms of uh, customs declaration, again, um, it's something that. Uh, for 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 companies that were already exporting outside the EU, well, that is uh, they're ready. You know, <laughs> they, they they know that they need to do a custom declaration uh, if they actually export outside the EU, and therefore those companies are are, are fine in that respect. Um, it, it is the, the the problem is with the companies that uh, were just exporting to the EU, and uh, you know they need to deal with that but i think that the custom declaration is one of the areas that from my experience people know about it companies know about it and that and it's quite straightforward in some ways uh, the, the problem is what we actually said before is uh, you know the, the you know if tariffs are applicable um and things like uh, you know uh, labeling and um, certifications uh, so for example for organic products um at the moment, there is a grace period until 2022. Uh, but then, uh, you know, in the meantime, possibly there's going to be more negotiations and see what is going to be the, the case on that. Uh, so the, the, the problems are um, more, what well, the problems, the challenges are more in those areas linked to the export, but not specifically to the documentation, the way I see it anyway. If you come, if you come to travel and you come to the um, freight travel, um, aviation is affected significantly, aren't they, by the by the changes as well? Um, how does that affect bringing goods in through the aviation route? So, in, in, in what respect? Well, you've only got point-to-point -point flights now, rather than rather than flights that are able to to move between various states. It's only a point-to-point -point, uh, flight system, isn't it? I, 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 I cannot answer that. I, I cannot comment on that. Sorry. Marcus, uh, you... yeah, mate, yeah, you're right. It's only point-to-point -point because the UK is now out of the, um, all the, the, the flight agreements, inner EU flight agreements. You can only fly from the UK to one destination in the EU and then have to book a, an, an ongoing flight from the EU. Say if you fly from London to Munich and you want to go on to Rome, you'd have to book that flight separately. That's and then going to apply to, to the freight costs as well, isn't it? In terms of freight will have to be, if you're splitting freight up. Yeah. But, but usually, again, I think that in that respect, uh, is uh, if you're actually using a uh, air freight as a, a route, uh, you know, as a as a, as a transport, uh, is is coming from one country. It's not, it doesn't actually stop. <laughs> it, it will actually come directly, let's say, from Italy to the UK, for example. It's not it's not like a, a groupage with a with like a transport. You know, it is already very expensive the air freight. And so if you actually think about that. Uh, a plane it goes uh, from uh, from Italy to Germany and then from Germany here. Well, again, it's but but, but then again, if it's the case, then uh, the point to point would actually be from uh, Germany to the UK. But as I said, I'm not 100% sure on the regulation, so it's just my view. Yeah, 
Yeah, uh, I, I agree with uh, Stefano. It's it's expensive. It probably wouldn't be sustainable to move stuff by air rather than road. Um, and uh, but as far as the the, the flights uh, are concerned, that's true. But that's obviously concerning more passenger travel than anything else. Yeah, I suppose, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, coming on to the CE marking, um, are we saying now that companies have to have a presence in the in the EU to allow the CE marking to apply? Yes. Or yeah, that's the case. So that's the case with labelling, CE marking, and other compliance uh, issues. You need to be in the EU now, and there's basically there are basically two ways of doing this either you seek an agent or an importer um, and as i said the risks here are is that you need to share uh, sensitive business information and b you don't really have full control over that market because you have to go via this third party um, and but it might be obviously the cheaper and easier option because you don't have to set up a company so everybody has to decide that for themselves. Mm. And the alternative would be EU presence, which means setting up a company in the EU plus a virtual office. But this is possible in many cases without, you don't need to be there physically. As a, any UK person um, can become the managing director of an EU company. As a, e, as a UK resident, yeah, so that's possible. Um, there are bilater bilateral um, tax agreements in place between, I think, all EU countries or most EU countries and the UK. So once you paid your tax in one jurisdiction, you can then transfer it to the UK tax-free. Um, so running a EU presence from the UK is today is fairly easy because you have service providers doing everything for you. You can forward the mail, the physical mail. You can have a front desk service answering calls in in the language of the the, the country you're in, plus English and so on. So it's uh, um, yeah yeah. So it's basically you don't need to replicate what you do in the UK. It's less than that. It's more of a legal entity. Just a legal entity sitting there. Okay. Yeah. And is that is that that is sufficient to enable you to still use the CE marking and simple labelling? Is it? Yes, it is. Mm. Obviously, you have to fulfil other requirements connected to CE marking and to labelling. Yeah, you have to make sure that you, as the the person or the organisation who brings it into the market, you also comply with the the rest of the documentation you need for CE marking. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. But you'd have to do that anyway. Yeah, yeah, that's, that was already there. And uh, that, that relates to mainly to engineering products. In, in terms of, you mentioned food safety. What is the regulation on the, on the food safety side that SMEs are going to have to consider now? Because we've, again, heard about the um, Scottish salmon and the problems of that being held up and so forth. Um, is this something grossly different to what is being done so far? This is a question for me. For, oh, okay, sorry. Uh, I, I'm just going to say that uh, I think Marcus mentioned uh, earlier about uh, um, the kind of uh, uh, certification for uh, agri-food uh, animals, and therefore that is uh, goes into that kind of provision. Uh, that is the sanitary and the phytosan uh, phytosanitary. So that is SPS measures, um, and therefore they need to follow that kind of. Uh, uh, rules in order to, you know, certify that the products uh, uh, comply with those uh, measures. Mm. And, and there, is a, there is a provision in the, in the, in the, in, in the agreement that basically on that. Is that a cost that SMEs are going to have to bear over and above what they've done before? I'm pretty sure that the certification is not going to be, but it's not going to be free, but possibly Marcus know a bit more about that. Mm. Um, I only know from what I've read regarding the um, the Scottish uh, seafood uh, exporters and basically um, in the article it said that for each crate of crabs or fish or whatever they have there, it's uh, 150 
uh, pounds for the vet to check it alone, plus other cost. Plus, I've read that now in order to they book full trucks. So basically, if they have a truck with mixed goods on it, the the customs clearances will take a lot longer because obviously you have to go through all the stuff at the at the customs. So they'd rather book a whole truck, which is then leaves three quarters empty or maybe something, just to get the stuff over quick enough in order for the customers in the EU to accept their goods. Because after four days, they're probably going to turn around and say, look, you're selling us old fish. We don't want it. Yeah. Right. So it took a day before. So this this is a real problem. Hence, this, this is why they were in the center of London with their trucks. Uh, yeah. This... Yes, yeah. Well, I mean, again, if, if companies have been exporting... Um, food overseas other than the EU, they will understand the, the veterinary clearance and the, the registration numbering system and the approvals you need to have for food safety. But I, I get the impression there's quite a lot of companies in that sector that are, are not actually exporting outside of the EU. So there's quite a lot of work for them to do to understand how to bring that about. And again, is that information on any of the DIT websites or the government websites? Yeah, the, the, the information is all there. Um, it's just a question of, uh, you know, when uh, we receive uh, inquiries from those kind of companies is to signpost them uh, to their right sources. Um, because you may, you know, it, there are so many companies oh, and they so, um, you know, the, our, our job is to actually make sure that the companies are, you know, compliant and ready to export. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, it's up to the company to actually make sure that they're aware that these resources are available. Uh, and if we actually get those inquiries, then we can post them as well. Um, but yeah. And I think that the, uh, in general, I mean, the, the, the barriers are not just tariff barriers. That is something that uh, need, companies need to be aware of. There are non-tariff barriers that sometimes are even more than the tariff ones. And, uh, and that is something that, uh, you know, uh, companies need to be aware of. Well, I think that's very true. I mean, again, I've been involved with a number of companies exporting out, obviously outside the EU. Um, all that you're saying and all that's being suggested, if you've gone down that route, most of it you understand. If you haven't gone down that route, particularly in the food industry, there are some very, very significant changes you have to make to your business. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I think that the, the DRT is aware of these non-tariff barriers and are working hard to actually kind of uh, um, not eliminate them. But yeah, that is, the, that is the aim. But they're working towards, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, making sure that these non-tariff barriers are, are less and less and less in the, in the, in the near future. Mm. Just, just revisiting the, the VAT rules, um, Marcus, these apply to both the EU, obviously, and to the UK operations. Um, that's a deferment for how long in terms of the deferment of that payment? Um, as far as I know, the deferment is only on the UK side. Um, and uh, I don't know for how long that counts, to be honest. It might be only... Um, Intermediately, it might be for a longer stretch. Do you happen to know that, Stefan, on the VAT? No, what I know is that there are, um, as I said, I'm not a specialist. Let's, let's, let's actually make that clear. I'm not a specialist in uh, customs and uh, VAT. Uh, you know, my job is to actually make people aware of, uh, companies make aware of these changes. Mm -hmm. But from my understanding, um, uh, attending quite a lot of webinars, and there are ways to actually defer uh, legally uh, VAT, customs. So there is a, what is called custom warehouse. So what, what, it, what the mechanism behind is that, the, you know, if you got a goods uh, coming in from the EU and then uh, um, you need to process them, you can actually defer the import duties uh, and therefore, uh, and the VAT. So there are mechanisms behind that. But as I said, I, I, when once I actually get those kind of um, 
uh, kind of queries from companies, uh, I just refer them to the specialists. And I think that is the best way because, uh, as I said, uh, international trade advisors are not uh, technically uh, and professionally trained to actually give that kind of information. It, it's quite complicated. And, um, you know, and sometimes, uh, you know, let's go back. I mean, I work with SMEs like Marcus. Now, having a custom warehouse costs money. So it depends. Uh, you need to do a cost and benefit analysis there. Is it work to have a custom uh, warehouse when uh, I need to actually kind of uh, uh, be uh, compliant with that? So that is a, then it becomes a commercial decision from the SME whether that is the way to go. But there are, as I said, there are mechanisms to actually uh, defer uh, customs and VAT. Um, yeah, okay, good, good. Uh, one thing from my experience, I can say that we have one client who um, is a big automotive supplier and um, he is the only person I know who is uh, who has a vet deferment or is part of a vet deferment scheme in the UK because it's it's not easy to apply to to apply for and I don't know about cost but um, he's the only client we have and basically in case of a deferment you can um, this is something else uh, uh, but uh, uh, this is something else than a, a bonded warehouse or customs warehouse because the goods are actually go into the country or out of the country and the vet you have to pay for it will be that payment will be deferred normally um, that's in, for instance the case in the Netherlands where it's much easier normally not from the time of import but the time you sell the goods so this helps greatly with cash flow yeah um, this is possible in the UK but very difficult it's very easy in the Netherlands a lot of people do it and Stefan I was right you got to consider the cost of a bonded warehouse yeah right. uh, and also if it's a bonded warehouse it's not in the jurisdiction it is legally somewhere in between the country where the stuff's been sent out and the UK. That's right. It, it's, it's fundamentally still the UK in many respects. It's, it's a non, it's a non tariff area. So you're sitting there with the goods uh, in, in transit fundamentally. Yeah. So you can't use the goods in the UK. If you do, you got to pay VAT. As you extract them out of the warehouse, yes, you yeah. pay VAT and any other conditions that may apply as well, of course. Yeah. But sometimes customs clearance is done from there as well. Yeah. So I had a, I had a client who imported grey motorcycles, so parallel imports, and there's always a danger of these being impounded because there's a uh, there's a court ruling by big manufacturers like Honda who, uh, by by pressure of their dealers, say you've got to take these people to court because they're they're trading illegally so this is why they keep the stuff in a bonded warehouse so german authorities wouldn't have power to to get to their products that's right okay um we, we've been talking about the the difficulties with the current legislation there's still a lot to be sorted out isn't there in terms of the agreement it's still very open-ended in certain areas yeah, I mean, the, the one area that Marcus, uh, you know, in the introduction of uh, the provisions uh, touched, uh, that is, uh, I think, is the most important one, but it's not goods related, is the financial services. That's right. So financial services is an area that, uh, you know, that uh, is still uh, is still open, um, and therefore that is something that uh, uh, we need to actually look at it closely. I mean, there was um, an article just this morning or yesterday um, about an interview with um, uh, the mayor of London that uh, basically it, it was reiterating that it's not just London, but, you know, 40% of the ser for financial services is London, but the remaining part is part of other part of the UK. So it's not going to affect just London, the square mile, uh, but it's affecting other... Um, companies that are dealing with the financial services. Uh, but at the moment, uh, we can actually give an answer on that, how it's going. Is it going to be good? Is it going to be bad? Of course, the EU uh, will have to actually get the financial services uh, in Europe because it's a, it's a very lucrative business. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we, we don't know. Um, 
there are there, there are ongoing uh, uh, negotiation on that. And uh, in March, if I remember correctly, there's going to be a kind of um, uh, another kind of a meeting or something like in March. Basically, is another key date for the financial services. Yeah, well, it's it's a, a sector of the business in in the UK that is very important. It, 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 it is very much in the air. I mean, we, we just don't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, gentlemen, we we've got three quarters of an hour covered so far. Um, are there any other points you'd like to raise? Because I mean, we 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 don't know all the detail yet. There are still issues, and Marcus was very good to bring out. Um, sort of top 10 points, as it were. Are there any other issues we should consider that we should discuss for a few minutes? Um, more than, more than uh, th um, as I said, it's not, you know, we tend to actually um, focus on the negative side. And, uh, you know, there are some positives, you know, in terms of uh, um, moving forward. Um, but at the same time, as I said, uh, these things uh, at the moment are, are real challenges that SMEs need to actually address. And, uh, and the DIT, myself in the Southwest as an international trade advisor, is there to help you and sign post companies to uh, uh, people like Marcus and other professionals uh, that they can actually help with these challenges. Uh, but as I said, it's no doom and gloom. <laughs> Just that uh, is you know we tend to focus on that. Yes, it's a, it's a, a really bad situation because of uh, uh, you know COVID and these changes. Uh, but again, I I'm I'm a positive person, so I always focus on the positive. And uh, you know, is it, companies need to do the same basically. Well, I, I, I was just going to come to that. What do we think are the opportunities? I mean, the market is there. Presumably, if we adapt to the market, then. We have the opportunity to grow. The, well, the, oppor the opportunities, for example, there are um, uh, again. We, we this this uh, webinar was focusing on the the post Brexit uh, uh, opportunities, uh, and uh, and in that respect, there are you know the the, the government is actually uh, trying to uh, strike a continuity deals with other countries. And uh, so we got, for example, a big opportunity that is outside Europe uh, that uh, the government is actually pushing quite a lot is uh, the agreement with Japan. So it's a, it's a difficult market, but these uh, agreements that have been um, kind of uh, struck um, towards uh, October 2020 is actually a, a, a continuation of the agreement that the EU had with Japan but it goes a bit farther. So those are the opportunities that other countries uh, that before uh, basically companies were a bit more reluctant. There are other countries where the UK can actually uh, make exports to. Uh, and I think that that is the where the opportunities are. Yeah. Uh, Marcus, any comments? Without, without, without forgetting the EU is a very, very important market for UK companies. Absolutely. Well, let's not forget that, you know. Um, yes, I agree with, with both of you, basically. You need to stay positive and you got to look at it. Yes, the uh, it is a lot more imp difficult and, t and costly and time-consuming uh, to export to the EU than it was uh, during the time of the membership. However, the hurdles are still lower than exporting to the rest of the world. Yeah. So that's good. And um, I think if you you now have can decide whether you want a pole position, you can be proactive and sell your goods into the EU and um, do that before your competition does. So that's also um, an advantage in, in uh, you know uh, being being competitive uh, with other UK suppliers of, of the same goods. So yes, there are advantages, obviously. Um, and, uh, as I said in the beginning, you make sure you export because you stay more resilient and it, it, it might save your business one day. Um, so don't put all your eggs in one basket. So therefore, um, it is what it is now. Um, and, uh, I'd recommend still, stay still export um 
and seek advice. The DIT, I would say, is a very good um, port of call. They can not only advise for free, you might get grants through them and so on and so on and so on. So on. Um, so, but they obviously, they can advise on, on stuff uh, inside of the UK and they also have connections to companies offering services outside of the UK in the EU or companies in the EU. Um, so uh, I talk to a lot, to DIPT people a lot, and they say, oh, what options do you have to, to provide to, to people we advise? And so we work together because I can then take over because the services we provide are predominantly in the EU. Yeah. Um, so we work hand in hand, basically. And I think the DIT always talk to them. They're, they're a really good contact and they can help you. And if you contact us, the initial call is free also. And um, yeah, so uh, so there's help out there. And, and But you need help. Someone whose business is to sell food or, or machinery um, has never looked at this side of trading before. You need help and you need to understand and assess your situation in order to make decisions. And the EU is not just one block it is 27 countries or even more with the EA and each have their advantages and disadvantages and you need to weigh up which is your best bridge for import of goods or services into the EU. Yeah I, I would go along with both of you and say that yes I think there's an opportunity here and for those companies that have been exporting and like I said ourselves supporting those companies and working with DIT accordingly as well um, it really is a question of adjusting your thinking that you are now dealing, as you said, with 27 different countries. Um, try and be the first. As you said, there is opportunity there. Um, it's no different than the world opportunity going to the US, going to India, going to China. It is a closer market. It's got a few advantages compared to the, those other markets. Um, come to the experts and let them help you. BIT the likes of yourselves, Marcus, and the likes of ourselves at Sabre UK. So I think opportunity is the name of the game. Yes, it's been portrayed as a lot of um, difficulty. International trade is not easy. You have to have the courage, the long liberty, and the muscle from your own point of view to actually move yourself forward. Yeah. Yeah. I agree, absolutely. Gentlemen, I think you, we, we probably finish now. And I think, first of all, thank you for your time and joining me on the, on the call. Um, there are on, uh, no questions currently, but I'm sure when it, once it goes live, we will see questions coming into all of us. So thank you again for your time. Thank you for participation. And I look forward to talking to you again.